Our next speaker is the well-known Joe Bastardi, formerly of AccuWeather, now with WeatherBell, and he does some of the most serious and insightful forecasting in the United States. He did a fantastic job last year of forecasting Hurricane Ian, one of his best forecasts ever. So he, today, he's going to talk about, is the weather getting worse? And I want to just add a quick prelude to this. When I started doing television weather in 1978, I had a TV dinner tray full of magnetic symbols that I'd put up on a metal board, and I had a teletype machine. Today, we have people running amok with cell phones trying to get video on CNN. We have all kinds of computer models. We have the internet. We have all these fantastic tools. And there's a bias associated with this. It makes everybody think the weather's getting worse because there's more information being gathered and presented thanks to the electronics revolution. So Joe's going to talk about that plus some other things. Thank you, Joe. Have at it. Stanley, I want you to bow your head and thank God that I'm not your next door neighbor because <laughs> I don't have my dad anymore to talk hurricanes, but I could see right now I'd, I'd be over at the house 24-7. Uh, well, you know, when, uh, when James talked to me about this, I said, you know what? I mean, there's so much stuff that can refute this. And it's absolutely not a benefit to me it's telling people that the weather, oh, don't worry about the weather, nothing's going on. I'm in the private sector, for goodness sakes. What the heck do you need me unless there's a disaster going on, right? You don't see me on TV say, hey, look at that big high pressure system over the central United States. Everybody's dancing around and happy. The fact of the matter is that if there's anybody in this place, in, in this, high, this whole place or whole world that wants the weather to get worse, it's me, all right? In fact, that was a big knock at AccuWeather that I would always look for trouble and try to supply the forecast for it. And, you know, because when I grew up, I didn't get put to bed with the stories of the three little bears. I got put to bed with the story of the three big hurricanes in 54. That's what my dad, that's what we talked about. So I, I, my, I, I came to the conclusion in the 70s and the 80s that my dad did not know what he was talking about. He used to tell me how bad the weather was in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. I'm like, yeah, sure, you're walking uphill both ways in the snow, even in the summer, just to get to school, right? You know, the old thing where the kids just don't believe their parents. But then I started looking at it, and I started looking because I was so darn bored with the weather in the 70s and 80s. I've always been a hurricane freak and a heat wave freak and a snowstorm freak. And basically the 70s and 80s, nothing that wasn't happening. So I went back and looked at the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And the, most, the more I looked at it, the more I said, boy, wow, why can't we have that today? In fact, you know that, <laughs> you know that Kimberly Clark, uh, is she a senator or something? Uh, she's a senator and she says that, um, oh, my child is having nightmares, you know, about climate change. I said, well, first of all, you must be an abusive parent to be doing that to your kid. That's, <laughs> secondly, I had the same nightmares except the opposite way. I was always worried the weather wasn't going to turn out as bad as I wanted it to. So I understand that. So is the weather getting worse? Well, if it is, we've adapted. So that's it. I'm done. Enjoy the weather. It's the only weather you get. I mean, seriously. And, you know, Alex Epstein talked about this. All right, so we have four times as many people on the planet now and 128 the climate weather deaths. Um, I don't know, do they want to go back to the 1930s? I guess they might, they may, they may want to. So, uh, you know, what I did was I said, you know what, instead of, you know, going over all these examples, because you can't compete with Pilkey and, and uh, all these other guys, I said, I'm just going to go back to the 1930s, the decade of my dad's youth and all the stuff he was saying, let's just look at it. So almost 100 years later, let's compare the 1930s with the last decade. Now, these are the daily high temperatures in the summer, and there's a lot of argument that we should be looking at max temperatures because the mins are coming up because of all sorts of different things that are going on, including, I think, increase in water vapor is, uh, you know, making the mins higher, or you could get the pen, you know, and Anthony's the expert at this. I mean, Penn State, when they put the, in 78, when we built the Walker building, the, uh, the, um, the instrument shelter was outside the Walker building, but there were no buildings 
from the, from the building to the golf course. So it got very cold at night on the golf course and you know, sun comes up, the air mixes, bang, the temperature goes down. Now they have buildings all around it. So, oh, nighttime temperatures are going up. It's like Las Vegas, right? So I like, I like to look at max temperatures, but this is, this is hard to believe. That's a whole decade. Now this past decade, the summertime maxes have been warmer in the West and a little bit warmer in Texas. And that's why, well, Texas last year, oh, this is the hottest ever. It's like one-tenth of one degree hotter than the hottest before, because it, so it's the hottest ever. So these relatively smaller changes, and they're happening more in the west than the east, and I think that may have to do with increased incoming solar radiation, because we clean the air in the west. That's another, we, right? We get all the sulfur dioxide out of the air in the western part of the United States, and the, um, the amount of smog days are down in Los Angeles. Point is, I mean, which, do you want to argue over this is worse than the 1930s? Okay, winter in the 1930s were colder, which means that the difference between summer and winter was more extreme than it is now. In fact, that's what I think is going on, that we are narrowing the range, right? Now, I always thought that, well, you want more extreme, you need a bigger range, right? So, you know, we're talking about the West. I hope everybody's at home with the range. Oh. Thank you. So where the deer and the antelope play, it is, it is getting colder. This past de decade, winter maxes, which is consistent with distorted, war I call it distorted warming. It's warming more relative to averages in the North than it is further in the South. And it would also, gee, aren't we in a, a warm cycle of the, uh, the oceans also? And, uh, you know, you see that in the, especially the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic Coast. And uh, also, listen, this is not just what's going on around the United States. There are very interesting things going on in the Indo-Pacific, which I talk about constantly on Weather Bell, that make it harder and harder and harder to get a consistently cold winter in the eastern part of the United States. If they start warm, you'll get cold in the middle like we did last year and the year before, and then it comes out. If they start cold like this year, you get the January thaw. Right? I mean, it's amazing how this is linked back and forth, but I'm going to go get in it. Nights in the 1930s were colder, too. Probably a lot of it had to do with the fact that um, there may have been less people around also. Um, but it, it, you can see the 1930s, if you're looking for more extremes, it's worse than this decade. So why are people telling us that it's so bad now? Um, the past decade, again, where water vapor has not affected temperatures the most, you can see in the central part of the United States, there's not much change. So what about precipitation? Remember the drought index takes into account demand. Al Gore? See, he doesn't, and, 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 and uh, Stead showed that with the, uh, you know, if you normalize the uh, amount of damage in a hurricane and actually adjust for what's going on. For instance, I would suspect that the demand in the 1930s was not as great as the demand now in the western part of the United States, right? There's all, the Washington Post, they just had the article on Lake Powell. It's at the lowest level ever. 22, well, it was built in 1960 for one, and it was serving 10 million people. That Now it's serving 42 million people. Secondly, I suspect it won't be at the lowest level ever when the record-breaking snowpack that's surrounding it actually melts off. And then we'll hear that the snow is melting faster than we've ever seen it melt before. And that's because there's so much snow and it stayed cold so long that when it finally got warm, what do you think the snow is going to do, okay? All right, so the, here's the growing season precipitation anomalies in the 1930s. All right, now let me ask you a question. We know about the drought in California, all right? Which do you think the United States as a whole, we're a big country, which looks worse to you, that or this? The most recent decade. It's like God has blessed America to grow food with that kind of situation right there. So, so what, what, by the way, I'm sitting there going, wait, wait, look at that. In the Colorado River Basin, there's actually a small area of above normal over the last decade. See, the fact of the matter is the West is a dry climate. You think, you fly into Las Vegas, I'm sitting there flying in Las Vegas, I'm going, look at all these golf courses. Like, how the heck do they keep these things green? Well, I, you know, you build, it's like the same thing with the wildfires. You go build your house out in the middle of the woods, well, guess what's going to happen? We got this town in Texas called the Woodlands. 
I don't know, and it's a beautiful place, but let's keep all the tall, skinny Texas pine trees up so we could have nature. Not only can you not see a house that you're supposed to be looking for, but what do you think is going to happen when a Texas hurricane comes along? It's just going to chop that wood up on top of all these houses. Oh, look at that. Climate change is increasing damage, right? So in what world are we not better off now? Look at the drought severity index, 2011 to 2020, all right? And remember, it takes into account demand. A lot more people living in Texas, a lot more people living in California, right? There are more people living in the Midwest, too. Look at it in the 1930s and consider how, how small the demand was in the 30s compared to what it is today. So how is, how is it possibly worse than today? Oh, you're cherry picking. You're telling me it's worse than ever, and I could go back to a decade? I mean, if, you know what, I could play the game with the 40s too. Now, all right, Stan did all the hurricane stuff, so you know, um, my, my dad used to always tell me when I was a little kid, hurricanes are nature's way of taking heat out of the tropics, redistributed into the temperate region, so the guy that can figure out what the tropics are doing will be able to understand what is going to happen to the global weather pattern. He used to always walk around saying that to me. And uh, he also used to always walk around talking about his shortcut storm into the mid-Atlantic states. 1933. I was like, oh, really? Well, look at this. What if you had today two major hurricanes hitting the United States within 18 hours? What do you think the reaction of the media would be today, right? So do you think the media even knows about this or... Uh, 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 the, the 1933 hit today. Now, Sandy was a bad storm, had extensive winds. We all know about Sandy, right? It went right over my dad's house in Atlantic City. My dad's been through eight hurricanes. And uh, he, uh, 27, 2796 pressure in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And when the wind came from the south, that's when it really got bad, he told me. He said the north wind, when the eye was approaching from the east, was not bad. He goes south, he goes for four hours. He said it was roaring like I thought I was in 38. That's the benchmark with him, 38. But if 30, 33, 33 hit at Virginia Beach, there were 86 mile an hour wind gusts all the way up to Long Island. You know, I wrote this thing called the Philadelphia Story. When I, I looked at the, when Isabel, was coming along in 2003. I said, what's the prevent a category two hurricane from hitting at the mouth of the Delaware Bay, shoving water up Delaware Bay like it did Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island, right, in 54 and 38. And then meanwhile, the heavy rains occurring with the hurricane naturally in the Delaware River Basin are coming down, converge right over Philadelphia, Wilmington. The question is, why hasn't that happened, right? As opposed to, whoa, how can that possibly happen? All right, and then there was 38, uh, not to mention Labor Day 35. So the hurricanes were worse back then, too. And I've got this whole idea that what we should do, uh, just if I were the director of NOAA, I'd dump tons of money into the hurricane research, and here's what I would do. I would create a power and impact scale that takes into account the size of the wind field also, because Harvey and Carla are not the same storm as far as the overall strength. Carla gave hurricane force winds to everybody on the Texas coast, and Harvey was relatively small. I realized it got stuck there, got captured by a cold trough. Or Donna versus Ian. I mean, Donna was just, um, well, as my dad did his uh, thesis at A&M on it, so I'm well acquainted with Donna. And, uh, so Stan talked about hurricanes, but I'll get to the cold in the 1933-34 was unbelievable. There's a movie out called Cinderella Man, one of my favorite movies because it is mostly true. And when I see a movie, the weather darn well better be what was going on. And it was brutally cold the year, uh, you know, James Braddock's kids were trying to, uh, you know, break up a fence because they had no... No way to heat their house in December of 33. That's when the movie was set. And um, so I went back and looked. And sure enough, December of 33 was very cold. But look at the difference there. I mean, are you kidding me? Can you, it's 25 degrees above normal, 20 to 25 degrees above normal in one part of the country and 15 degrees below normal. That's over a period of a month. And February 34 was close to 20 below normal in New England after the December that was 15 to 20 above normal in New Orleans or whatever it is. I mean, when do we, when do we even see that anymore, right? Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I think of extremes, I think, well, Cold is cold, warm is warm, right? So 
it seems to me that if I can just off the top of my head go, <laughs> you know, James asked me to talk about extremes, I'll go back to the 1930s. I like to go to the 50s because that was, uh, you know, oh, this Texas drought is so bad. Well, let me tell you something. In 52, 53, 54, all right, the, droughts, the drought that hit Texas in those three years and gave birth to the Junction Boys and the Texas Aggies story back in 1954, uh, and that's when I started learning about because Bear Bryant was at A&M and this whole big, uh, whole big thing, and my, I grew up down there, about how they took the team out to Junction, Texas. And 118 guys went out there and only 20 came back, but that became the nucleus of a team on the Southwest Conference. But it was the hottest, driest summer in Texas, on Texas record, 54. So what does all this mean? Well, if I could just go back to the 1930s and find worse weather and more deaths, how is it this missive about a, a, getting a more extreme exists? And what is at the root of this? So just consider the five aspects of evil. Evil creates confusion and contention. Evil is expert at fooling others with smooth speech and flattering words. Evil craves and demands control. And the highest authority is their own self-reference. Evil plays on the sympathies of goodwill people, often Trump in the grace card. Evil has no conscience, no remorse. All right, so, you know, I, 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 at my age of 67, you know, I figured out, well, this, God must have made me to do this. So if I stay focused on him, his wind's at my back. So to me, that part of this whole aspect is spiritual. People are, oh, there he is. He's talking about God and the weather. And God gives, hey, let me tell you something. If you're a meteorologist focused on the good Lord above, God never gives you an answer. He gives you questions and tells you, get up off your butt, use your talent, and answer those questions, right? And there's nothing like the weather. To, to teach humility. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, well, it's absolutely true. You know, when I was working at AccuWeather, it was every awful the glory of AccuWeather, AccuWeather, this AccuWeather, the Hurricane Center says this, we got to say that, blah, 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 right? And so I, I and, you know, Neil Frank, and I've always been spiritual. Well, Neil Frank would come on and, you know, he's a very spiritual man. And, you know, Neil would, Neil was a very humble guy. And I was like, we're AccuWeather, blah, 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 blah. And the one guy, one of these times, I go to Houston quite often, I'm going to show up at his house and tell him, man, you had it down from the get-go, right? And so what it has taught me is, and I think if you're a good scientist, all right, I don't know if I, I'm, I'm, I call people, I say, well, I'm more like a bare-knuckle guy in a bar or something rather than the rules of Queensberry science, you know, right? I used to think peer review was a guy walking up and down the beach looking at the docks and trying to figure which one was going to fall in. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. But I think what, what, what I have found out is the more I know or the more I learn, I realize the less I knew and the less I actually know compared to the entire system, which would, if you believe in the creator and the infinite majesty and power of God, the weather is the greatest example of that. And so these kind of things where people, I think a lot of it has to do with if people trying to convince other people that if I control you and your actions, I can control the atmosphere and make everything safe. Well, hey, you know, we have a saying in Italian, solo rischi ando tu vivere, which means there is no life without risk, all right? So I think that the natural order of things is chaos to order. In, in our lives, we have chaos, all right? And by restoring order, we strengthen ourselves, right? There's a challenge. Well, the atmosphere does the same thing. And this is uh, uh, Bob Enlix here from A&M, and I don't know, my dad taught me, uh, and my dad's an ag and meteorologist, he said, the thing they taught at A&M, that weather and climate was nature's way of always trying to, uh, to correct an imbalance that it cannot correct because of the design of the system. So there's constant back and forth, constant swinging, all right? Now you have people that have turned the weather and dragged it into the sewer, which is really what it is. I mean, I was a weather geek from when I was a kid. I can't even believe I see the stuff I see going on now with what was the subject. Oh, look. My nickname was Blizzard Belly when I was a kid. I mean, that's what a geek I am. Now, all of a sudden, it's a big political thing where, you know, you got all these people doing stuff. So, for me, after watching all this, it brings 
uh, a lot of attention to our side, mostly bad. I think there's something bigger at work here. I just went over this. And uh, th this is an interesting talk here that I've just given because it's the first time I've ever ended up under time, which is good because we have a guy who can really talk over here, Doc, uh, uh, Chris Bonkton. <laughs> so anyway, I'm done. Thank you very much for your attention. God bless you all.